Cathay Pacific represents the cornerstone of luxury air travel in Asia. For someone like my mom, a Hong Kong native, it's the only way to fly in Asia. However, for newer generations like me, I'm now considering lower cost carriers as the way to go. Resolving issues and key challenges like this, particularly as the importance of the Asia Pacific region in global air travel continues to increase, will be paramount to Cathay Pacific's success. Hello, my name is Sasha, and today I'm joined by my colleagues Karen, Elena, and Karina. Thank you, esteemed judges. We are excited today to dive into these exciting opportunities and find ways for Cathay Pacific to soar into the future. We'll first begin with a company analysis and then dive into the Aspire Hire strategy, which is comprised of three parts. First is Taxi, which emphasizes further cost saving strategies. Then is takeoff, where we focus on revenue maximization in three key areas. And finally is SOAR, which emphasizes labor management, particularly with unions. We'll then go through the implementation and finances and finally end off with our key takeaways. So if we first take a look at Cathay Pacific today, the competitive edge is clear. Cathay Pacific is a premium go-to carrier for the Asian airline market. However, the key challenge is now occurring over the 2016-17 fiscal year with, a, with the first financial loss of 575 million Hong Kong dollars. We must prevent this from occurring again because the opportunity in the Asia Pacific region is so large. Asia Pacific region now comprises one third of global air travel, two fifths of all global cargo, and has um, almost 6% growth annually, and that's expected to continue well into the 2030s. The opportunity here is clear. Now, if we begin to look into the Cathay, um, Cathay Aero's ecosystem, we can see a breakdown of the revenue, profit growth, and margins of the different areas. Passenger services, as discussed previously, uh, previously has exhibited negative profit growth. However, the size of the overall revenue comprises two thirds of our overall current business. If we take a look at other areas like catering, this is relatively small to our core business. Whereas Cargo and the Asia Miles Limited, which is our loyalty program, are both key, both because they have positive profit <coughs> growth and comprise large portions of our overall revenue generation and are higher margin than our passenger service. What this means for us is that the focus areas for our improved profits are in three key areas. First is in passenger services because it comprises such a large portion of our revenue. Second is the cargo area because it exhibits high industry growth in Asia. And third is our loyalty program because that's how we can increase the revenue spend per customer. So now let's really do a deeper dive into our key revenue drivers. We segmented our analysis into core business and auxiliary services. From here, we identified three key areas for the recommendation to focus on. First is the branding of Cathay Dragon because there was branding confusion when we moved from Dragon Air to the Cathay Dragon name. Because there are huge, huge opportunities within China, this is something that we must clarify. Second is the idea of improving the service quality and industry ranking, as well as the overall perceived safety of our airline. This is not just important as a branding and revenue issue, but for the long-term sustainability of our business. And third is the idea of improving our loyalty program to really maximize the benefit that we're providing to, um, to our customers, as well as the revenue to them. Now, if we quickly look at the key cost drivers in the analysis here, we've identified three target areas. First is cargo and supply chain management and really driving it into the future through technology. Second is human resources to improve the happiness and satisfaction of our employees. And third is the goods not for resale, and that's something that um, Karina is going to dive into in the recommendation overview. Great, so now that we've identified some key insights and challenges that Cathay Pacific is currently facing, let's dive into the Aspire Hire strategy that is comprised of three main parts. The first one is taxi. This deals with cost reduction. There are two main areas that we've identified that can significantly reduce costs. The first is with the goods not for resale optimization, so how can we make that management a lot more efficient? And the second is blockchain integration when it comes to your cargo business. And with this, we expect 2.3 billion USD saved by year two. The second part of our strategy is takeoff, and this deals with revenue maximization. And there are three key areas we see real opportunity to do this. The first 
is seat optimization and conversion. So taking the business class seats that are not currently being sold very well and converting them to economy premium. premium. Second is expanding partnerships to really leverage areas that could be add-on services to the basic plane ticket. And third is strengthening loyalty to encourage return customers and passengers to Cathay Pacific. With this, we expect $1.15 billion in, in incremental revenue. And lastly, we're looking at your long-term vision of three of in three years really improving performance. And this is where labor relations and ensuring your employees are happy and serving passengers well. This is where we will be dealing with employee training programs and union relations. This is expected to improve your efficiency and performance over the long term. Great. So to begin, we've already seen that you have some tremendous initiatives underway in terms of cost cutting. And this isn't where you're going to derive your sustainable competitive advantage, but rather the way that you're going to make sure that you keep up with the rapidly evolving and changing industry. So in terms of what you already have going on underway, we've seen the 30% reduction in staff, which has heavily impacted employee morale, which is something that we're going to manage through our HR initiatives. We've seen your efforts towards fuel efficiency in order to reduce your fuel costs, and we've seen the changes that you've made from your nine to 10 um, seat changes, and how that may have impacted your brand position, which is something we'll, that we'll address further in our takeoff part of our strategy. But in terms of your cost savings, we're going to recommend two additional recommendations in addition to what we've seen. These are both opportunities for more quick wins in terms of cost savings so that we can fuel the revenue generation that will occur through positive brand management. So the first of which is GNFR, Goods Not For Resale Optimization. You have tremendously, tremendous opportunity for economies of scale over all of your different ownership in different business lines. So anything from pillows to blankets to non-consumer impacting activities, so things that they receive on the airlines that they don't necessarily pay for, there's a huge opportunity to go to market with a request for proposal and negotiate an optimal price on all of the goods not for resale products that you give to your consumers. That way, one, you'll be able to reduce the fees that you're paying currently if you haven't optimized in the past five, 10 years. And then second, you'll be able to leverage economies of scale across all of your auxiliary businesses. The second key way that we plan to save costs is through cargo optimization by integration of IBM blockchain. We propose that you partner with them in order to better track routes, optimize your cargo loads, and also reduce your costs and improve speed. A bonus of this effort is that you'll increase demand for these services because you'll be on the forefront of integrating data and innovation properly into effective cargo management. Moving on from the cost saving, we plan to use the dollars that we save really in order to fuel growth top line for your company. And we're going to do this in two main ways. First, by increasing the revenue that you're able to charge per seat. And then second, through your key priority of increasing revenue per passenger. Revenue per seat will be increased through increasing the number of economy, economy premium seats and decreasing business class seats in line with consumer trends, though while maintaining your positioning as a premium offering um, airline rather than a low cost carrier. Through revenue per passenger increases, we will increase your number of corporate partnerships in order to really offer your passengers unique offerings, whereby they'll be able to take a Cathay Pacific flight and then also go to Disneyland, as we'll elaborate upon further. And then as well, strengthen the loyalty program so as to really leverage the revenues that you bring in, as we've seen through your 1 million passengers on the loyalty program already, you brought in a quarter of your revenues, which is really substantial. All of these efforts will be coupled with substantial marketing efforts that we'll elaborate upon further in order to really clarify your brand. So let's take a look at a potential breakdown of how you want to optimize your revenue per seat. Currently, let's take a look at your Boeing 77 airlines. They have approximately 250 seats and we've divided them by business class, economy premium, and economy seats. The breakdown, as you can see, is around 20%, 20%, and 60%. However, because many of the business class seats are currently not being sold, we believe that there's an opportunity to slightly shift this breakdown and maximize your, and increase your economy premium seats. With this new breakdown, you'll still be able to maintain the more comfortable edge of your overall Cathay Pacific brand, but be able to reduce the number of unsold business class seats and increase the occupied economy premium seats. 
Overall, we don't want to shift too much of their seat, their seat distribution because Cathay Pacific only has 250 as opposed to Air Canada, which has over 400. So we want to maintain this comfort, but we believe by slightly adjusting the business class economy premium, this will allow you to increase revenue, which Kerno will walk you through that numbers later. Second, let's take a look at how we want to increase our loyalty program rebound. Currently, your loyalty program is very successful, but we want to increase the spend per customer. How we plan on doing this with three main strategies. First, to increase the dollar spend, we want to partner with local airports and increase the number of duty-free opportunities on board. By working with airports and sharing this information, airports will also be able to benefit from these increased purchases by our customers, and we want to have a revenue sharing model, be able to leverage these two uh, partnerships together. Second, we want to offer new products. Similar to many Air Asia flights and other air yeah, flights that are currently available, there are many packages because customers are now flying more and more frequently. As opposed to purchasing one flight at a time, by thinking ahead of the future, we want to offer discounts. Discounts in terms of purchasing 10 or more products at once, and this will allow customers to feel more comfortable in purchasing and staying with their pro program, and also reduce and increase their switching costs overall. Thirdly, we also want to look at the number of aware overall awareness. So what this means is your loyalty program is one of the most successful drivers of your revenue today. However, how can we attract more customers to your loyalty program? We propose offering vouchers. What does this look like? As opposed to a customer who just stumbles across your loyalty program on themselves, we want to offer them an opportunity to try your lounge for once and see what this offer offers for them. Once they are able to experience this loyalty, this loyalty program, they'll be incentivized to, be, to return and be exposed to all these other different opportunities. Overall, this will increase the number of uh, low royalty and increase the revenue per program and increase your switching costs, like I mentioned earlier. Secondly, with all of this loyalty programs, we're going to be gaining a lot of insight on your current customers. In particular, it's extremely integral that we understand the customer demographics. We've identified three key customer demographics, leisure flyers, business flyers, and family flyers. By having these understandings of our key demographics, we're going to be able to provide more data-driven recommendations. What exactly does this look like? Well, we can provide better packages for your customers depending on what kind of flights they're taking. For example, for a business person, once he's flying from point A to point B, he might need a connecting um, trip to his hotel. He might also need um, hotel deals. And for a family, they might also want to have vacation deals for the amusement parks that arrive and once they're actually at their destination. By partnering with these other organizations, they're also going to be able to access more information on your customers, so we'll be able to grow together. But moreover, we want to increase and bring together this data opportunity that we see because you have so much information on your customers. Great. So what's important is really also to clarify the brand, because we've seen that the way that customers are perceiving the safety and the uh, lack of clarification between the dual branding is really hurting the brand's reputation. So the two key goals of the marketing initiatives are to clarify the dual brand between Cathay Pacific and Cathay Dragon, and then to position the brand as luxury in a market full of low-cost carriers. So we're going to unify the branding as well through the on-plane recommendation of having the same logos on the planes of the green wings. But moreover, we're going to do a branding YouTube campaign. We've seen that um, a lot of Asian consumers identify with real life examples, around 70% are recorded according to Statista, and with 84% with family examples in their advertising. So we're going to have a real life YouTube video whereby we will unite a family from overseas and using Cathay Pacific and Cathay Dragon Airlines to connect this family. And we're going to do it in sort of a story between the family members so that we can really get them to know the family. As well, we're looking at a social media campaign to highlight the premium offerings that really have people associate this brand as a higher end brand and not a low cost carrier. And this will consist in premium food on board with hashtag foodie on board and social media, as well as um, advertisements that really highlight the eco-friendly nature of the airline, as this is a priority that more luxury airlines are focused on rather than low cost carriers. As well, it's important to really um, engage with our audience on the new offerings that we're going to have in order to really increase the number of consumers. So in the airport, we're going to encourage our partnership stores to advertise X dollar spend equals X number in loyalty points so that flyers are really translating the spending into their loyalty gain. As well in social media, particularly WeChat, Facebook, and QQ, we're going to show conversions between spending and actual loyalty points. So we're gonna show a handbag purchase 
um, and then converting into a flight, saying, pathway loyalty program, where can your handbag take you, in similar examples. As well for our corporate partnership marketing, we're going to look at social media marketing, whereby we demonstrate the examples of stories that you see people engaging with. So a family on the plane, and then in their hotel, and then at Disneyland through Polaroid <coughs> pictures. Again, really engaging in relatability and real life examples for our advertising, saying from door to Disneyland, pathway connects you, or with our business example, from door to desk, pathway connects you. Really giving people examples that they can connect with based on our data-driven approach. The implementation we see, we'll go through further in the Q&A if you have questions, but we're seeing that we'll have 32 to $37 million increase in revenue per year as a result of these revenue initiatives. So one other thing that we want to look at is long-term sustainability. As we mentioned before, currently we understand that we need to improve employee morale and union relations. Let's walk you through how we plan on doing this. So within employee morale, as we can see, within employee morale, um, what we want to do is increase the overall ratings that your company currently has. Unfortunately, the service ratings have been dropping, and we want to be able to uh, mitigate the fears that many employees have after seeing all of these cuts recently. How we plan on doing this is by increasing top-down communication and also strengthening service training and having better feedback systems within the company. In addition, for the union relationships, because unions pose a very high threat of potential revenue loss, what we want to do for unions is to invite the union rep to management meetings and have stronger consistent relationships and communication channels. Overall, this will increase the sustainability for the company in the long term because we see these two um, positions as being a very important foundation for the company since people are the underlying drivers for any business. Within the timeline, we'll be happy to walk you through the details in Q&A, but as we can see here, overall, from the cost savings that we mentioned earlier for our goods not for sale and the blockchain, in addition to the potential savings we could have by having higher um, employee morale because employees will be more productive and will have mitigated risk from union relations, this can lead to over $2 billion of saving annually. So let's take a look at what this <coughs> all means in terms of our profits and losses by year two. The main revenue sources and cost savings where we have inflow of cash include the cash we get from people increasing their spend on vacation deals, their loyalty programs, increased ticket sales for a Cafe Dragon, as well as the cost savings from the optimization of GNFR and the cargo business where we are implementing blockchain. Now, if you look at the costs that are compared to this, you'll see that each project has quite a high ROI. This means that by year two, you will be able to, in a bullish case, uh, reach beyond your 2015 performance of 109,000 million HKD, and even in a bearish case, at least meet that 2015 revenue figure of 102,000 million dollars. So now let's really take a look at everything as a key cohesive strategy together. In Taxi, we emphasize the cost savings ability, both by looking at the goods not available for resale and by implementing blockchain. In an overall implementation horizon, we see that this can all be achieved over a three year period. This means that we're going to achieve revenues of 2.36 to 2.56 billion per year. In Takeoff, we saw three key initiatives in revenue that will actually help us to bolster our current revenue streams, and these can be aggressively pursued over a two-year period, allowing us to achieve additional revenues of 32 to 37 million. And finally, in SOAR, this will allow us to really ensure the long-term sustainability by improved employee relations, uh, better employee efficiency, and overall better employee satisfaction in labor union relations. And this will also be continued on a continued basis. Overall, this will allow us to achieve additional revenues of 2.4 to 2.6 billion per year. So now, let's really summarize everything that we've heard today. Through the Aspire Hire strategy, revenues will at the very least return to the 2015 performance, which means we'll never let you be in the red again and achieve 102 to 109 billion HKD through various new revenue streams. Operations will also be significantly more streamlined through technological integration and will realize cost savings of 2.3 billion USD through blockchain and GNFRS initiatives. The Cathay brand image will also be known as a leading Asian premium airline and this will really clarify the Cathay Dragon brand as well. 
Thank you, and we're excited to soar and aspire higher together. We now open the floor to questions. Um, two questions. Um, what barriers do you see would, could stop you from implementing this strategy? And secondly, what are the risks that you have identified in implementing this? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we've identified some key risks and mitigation associated with this strategy, some of which are particular to the industry and the market in general due to the macroeconomic and external factors, and some of which are related to the strategy in particular. So we see in terms of external and macroeconomic factors, decreased um, disposable income as well as the fuel and oil prices and hedging we've seen. We suggest mitigating that as they have in the past with hedging prices and then matching the industry in terms of macroeconomic management. But that's not where they'll really be able to sustain competitive advantage. The areas where we see there might be some increased risk are really with the competitors as low-cost carriers. And that's why we intend to mitigate that with really branding positioning as a premium service, highlighting the, um, um, the package deals through corporate partners as well as the on-board um, enhanced features that we have. Another foreseeable risk is the union strikes as well as a barrier, but that's why we um, have identified the importance of effective HR management from the outset, from now, from until year three and moving forward, as well because this will increase the scores that um, users have rated for the airline online. Um, in addition, we've identified some other potential risks, including foreign currency risks, um, the branding perception, and employee difficulties. We'd be happy to elaborate upon any of them further if you have specific questions. Sure. How about yeah, mm -hmm. uh, just in that? Uh, so, so clearly, a large part of your uh, strategy, and particularly brand positioning, is about uh, trying to get away from being perceived uh, more as low cost mm -hmm. into a premium. So, how about the price elasticity of, of customers? You tested that. Isn't that a big risk that you spend a lot on and, and position yourself as a premium brand, and therefore need to obviously uh, have higher pricing? Right. But absolutely. Will customers uh, pay that? Absolutely, and that's a great question. What we've seen is the trending towards low-cost carriers, obviously, because of their comparative low cost and the importance of customer elasticity in this space. However, what we've seen as well is there's a large spectrum in the market whereby the average price or the lowest price of a Cathay um, Pacific flight is around 518 US dollars, with the low-cost carriers being around $300, and we see with Qatar Airways and luxury premium going all the way up to $5,000. So what we plan to do here is maintain a sustainable competitive advantage by offering our customer services that are valuable, rare, inevitable, and non-substitutable among other airlines. So how we intend to do this is by really enhancing their experience in flight and through advertising, but also through increasing their switching costs by way of the loyalty programs so that customers can justify to themselves spending a bit more on this flight, but they'll be able to accumulate loyalty points that they'll be able to put towards other services, use towards cost savings and activities in the area where they're visiting, and as well that they'll be able to save money by continuing to fly time and time again. So in the long term, we're encouraging them to make a relationship with their airline and not just to choose necessarily the cheapest flight that comes up on their Google page. And of course, that is re closely related to our brand positioning, but we're confident that through brand positioning and the increased services, this is something we can achieve. And just to add on to what my colleague said, in particular with clarifying the brand with Dragon Air, now Cathay Dragon, we saw that Dragon Air was actually incredibly <coughs> successful already in the Chinese market. Um, however, after acquiring it in 2006 and then rebranding in 2016 to Cathay Dragon, there was a lot of confusion over what type of airline it actually was and whether it was the budget airline under Cathay Pacific. So what we really want to do is just re-clarify the brand presence and who Cathay Dragon really is to the consumer, and we're confident that there's still such strong demand in China for it. Other than perhaps the blockchain um, recommendation, a lot of the recommendations are already in the market, you know, sort of packaged slightly differently for this solution. Were there any sort of radical ideas that you considered um, to make a totally different solution that no other airline is currently providing? And if so, why did you not then proceed with um, talking about it? So perhaps one idea that we did consider is actually we want to prevent the company from putting themselves at risk of once again ostracizing their customers. So what we want to do really is build these relationships that we have right now and provide more loyalty programs for customers that perhaps they already are familiar with. So opportunities where customers feel comfortable with and engaging with their company in the long term. 
and that, given that reason, we prevented um, ideas that perhaps might not seem as radical, but we believe that customers will be familiar with them, and since we offer more and stronger relationships with them in the long term, they might feel more obliged to stay with us as opposed to trying something that they might not, they might not be comfortable with. As well, in terms of radical moves that we haven't seen as much in the space, airline is an industry that hasn't really been disrupted by consolidation. We've seen in grocery, for example, the acquiring of pharmaceuticals, whereby they own more of the supply chain of consumer interaction. Something we considered is a large-scale acquisition whereby the airline could own more of their chain of consumer interaction in the customer life cycle. Maybe they could acquire services of shuttling customers to the airport or actually of acquiring a really important part of the customer journey or a hotel. However, by nature of their financials and the fact that they're so um, heavily leveraged by virtue of their um, assets and all of the airplanes, that was something we didn't think they could pursue at this time. However, the fact that the airline industry isn't one that's been yet really disrupted by consolidation is something that's interesting and we think Cathay should look to. Could you also touch on a bit on the various uh, uh, marketing initiatives that, that you would have? Uh, how do you propose to fund it? How much of it would be self-funded uh, versus what do you have to borrow? Yes, absolutely. So we have made a few assumptions based on our goals and previous campaigns that we have known about. In terms of the marketing campaign, the majority of it will be to reintroduce and we instigate the brand image of Cathay Dragon to the Chinese market. And for this, we have, uh, d we have two main initiatives. The first one is really based on online marketing because 98% of tier one city um, inhabitants in China are at least on WeChat or some other social media platform. And so for this, we have decided to outsource to a local ad agency so that we are in line with the uh, market preferences there. And we have allocated in total uh, just over $1 million for the six month campaign. Now, the second part of it is also um, reintroducing the whole idea of um, the hashtag foodie on board. And so one of our ideas for this is actually inviting a world-class chef to cook and prepare these meals because one of our core competencies is actually being um, a catering service for the airlines. So for this, we have, we have identified Sister Lee from Toronto as a, as a suitable candidate for this, and we have allocated a portion of that a budget for uh, this uh, campaign as well. Have you thought about the, the fact that the other uh, airlines have, for example, both larger planes, A380s and so on, and CAFE has not, and we are just shifting some of the seat configurations a little bit more to the premium economy. How is that going to impact the disposition of their brand as a premium carrier? So one of the things that Cathay has certainly excelled at is being known as a comfortable and premium airline. And that's why they haven't changed from the 9 seat per row to 10 seat per row, so that each, each even economy passenger has enough leg room. Now, in this case, we have, the problem we have noticed is that they are not as profitable this way because they can't seat as many people because so much of their plane is dedicated to first class and business class passengers. And we've seen with the data given in the information that you've provided that the business class and first class seats are not being sold as well as they were previously because of many corporate trends going towards uh, zero cost based systems. And so what this means is that we don't want to convert the economy seats necessarily to 10 seats per row, but instead to keep that premium brand image, we can convert some of the business class seats that are not currently being sold very well into economy <coughs> premium. In addition to what my colleague said, we do want to emphasize that the company has been experiencing significant loss in the past several years, and we believe that's integral that you serve first have a strong foundation with their current loyalty program. In particular, the loyalty program is very low cost and in particular drives much higher profit margins. So therefore, by strengthening this position first, we then see the opportunity of perhaps increasing your investments. But given your current financial um, position right now, this is why we think this is a better short-term strategy. A lot of your cost cutting is heavily reliant on um, rolling up your blockchain. How confident are you around that too? I mean, I don't need to go through the details, at least, at least kind of provide a high level as to why even that 2.3 billion is going to be realistic and what are the components to achieving that? Absolutely. 
So in terms of cost cutting, we recognize that your company already brought in McKinsey to, to come up with a lot of great cost saving initiatives. So that's something that in terms of your strategic plan over the next few years, you're already really excelling at. So we felt that our job was to bring in more innovative solutions in terms of cost cutting. We feel confident that blockchain really is the future for supply chain management. Blockchain will allow us to increase efficiency through better communications. Right now, the industry is oftentimes working off paper and pencil, information gets lost, and as a result, cargo is either slowed and held up at different ports, or it gets lost altogether. We think that improving the efficiency here has amazing cost savings ability, and furthermore, also has the ability to really improve and bring in more revenue to our cargo services by bringing in more business because we'll be a leader and a forefront in the industry. In addition to what my colleague has said, uh, there was actually a recent report published by Accenture that said that in industries like this, blockchain implementation can actually reduce costs by up to 70%. So this cost does this cost saving number does seem almost exorbitantly high. However, because of this groundbreaking technology and with this research backed by Accenture, we do are, we are confident that this is something that is attainable. Now, if you see the ROI here, it's incredibly high. So even if these cost savings are slashed by half, this is already a very worthy investment. And uh, what are your thoughts on the current uh, layoffs that have been announced? To what extent would, would you keep it, reverse it? Absolutely. Um, the fact that Cathay Pacific has announced very publicly that they're undergoing a large-scale transformation with McKinsey Consultants, for a lot of people following the news, they would have likely assumed that would be followed by many layoffs. And while that's incredibly unfortunate for the management of the company, it's something that's very important for them to manage through their PR, but also incredibly importantly through their internal HR management. So the fact that these 600 layoffs occurred, none of this actually happened in the customer facing end. All of this was rather in the back office. So that's why we're encouraging that internally they manage their human resources by increasing their customer training programs, increasing the task identification and job satisfaction of their employees by really having better feedback mechanisms in place as well as training to enable better relationships with their unions. In terms of PR facing activities to the public, they've already been communicating the transformational efforts with the public and people understand that there are a lot of cost reductions that are associated with airlines in the turbulent time of low-cost carriers. However, to continue to maintain positive public relations and this transparency to the degree that it can be upheld um, will ensure that in the future, Pathway Pacific is still perceived positively in the media and by their own employees. It's generally easier to increase revenue than decrease costs. What opportunities did you look at for China, Pearl River Delta, etc.? So one information that we do want to emphasize is the One Belt, One Road uh, initiative that China is undergoing. We believe that it's integral that Cathay Pacific be a part of this uh, monumental investment that the current country is undergoing. So what we want to propose is having potential um, ongoing continuous flights with Cathay Pacific passengers to then take a shorter, a shorter flight for, uh, for perhaps a Cathay uh, Dragon flight afterwards. For example, if you're flying a longer, longer distance for Cathay Pacific, we want to then connect you with a potential shorter, shorter flight afterwards for your next that next destination for Cathay Dragon. As a result, um, this will be able to leverage the increased flight traffic overall, but also uh, help the customer be more accessible to the different flight opportunities that are available for them. And since we do have strong loyalty programs, we do want to offer them also discounts if they are with us as a long-term customer. given that we have slightly more time. Uh, you haven't touched on much about uh, the oil price volatility and uh, as the, the case mentioned, uh, uh, one of the potential uh, uh, issues in, in the hedging. So what are your thoughts on that? Would, uh, given where prices are at the moment, would you hedge it, not hedge it? Or, or how would you come up with the uh, uh, thought process or recommendation on that? So with Cafe Pacific currently and their current strategy, we've seen that hedging has unfortunately been unsuccessful. That being said, the company is still investing in very renewable planes, and we see this as a more long-term viable uh, solution. In particular, in Hong Kong, since this is where your headquarters is based, since the since the, the Hong Kong has a lot of carbon taxes and China itself has a carbon cap and trade system, we believe that this is possible to leverage these renewable planes and potentially invest in more renewable planes in the long term because this will overall generate better tax savings and you can even sell excess credits uh, if we do see these planes being perhaps
perhaps more effective. So hedging, unfortunately, isn't unsuccessful, but because we have a more long-term vision and plan with our renewable jets, we see this as a successful venture and being able to shift towards a more green energy society. Yeah, I'll squeeze in. Just a few more seconds. Yeah. Okay.